Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> um, as Pat said, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with these this collection again after actually closer to 15 years. Um, I was living in Dorset at the time. Um, it was in 1996 that Napache first brought a few drawings from this series to the co-op for sale. And um, we looked at them and we were intrigued. She'd never done anything like this before. And um, so we bought a handful that she brought in. And uh, Jimmy showed them to me, and I always took a particular interest in uh, the local history and the oral history of the people living in Dorset, and I realized that she had written on all of the drawings in syllabics in order to explain the circumstances and the people in the drawings. So uh, the drawings themselves were fascinating, but it was when we first started to translate uh, the first group of drawings that uh, Jimmy said, do you think we should buy more? <laughs> I said, absolutely. Tell her if she has more stories that she would like to tell to please continue to bring them in and we will buy them from her and have them translated. So from 1996 until about 2000, 2001, she worked on this collection of drawings. She died in 2002, so it really for her um, I think was motivated by her own uh, final years and her failing health and she decided that she would like to tell uh, both her own personal stories and the stories of going back about two generations. So one of the first drawings that she brought in was of her grandfather, <coughs> Namanai. He, he was her paternal grandfather and he was a camp leader in one of the outlying camp areas down from Cape Dorset. He was a, uh, also a shaman and a very powerful camp leader. He died before Napache was born, but stories of his exploits uh, survived and were told to her by her mother. So just to tell you who Napache was, for those of you who don't know, she was uh, the daughter of Pitsulaka Shuna. And uh, sh her brothers, were Kaka Ashuna, Kiwa Ashuna, and Namonai Ashuna. So she was part of an artistic dynasty um, in Cape Dorset, uh, a member of the second generation of Inuit artists. So her lifespan from 1938 until 2002 um, represent the sort of waning days of the traditional camp system. Uh, so she was born in 1938 on an island called Saruk in one of the outlying camp areas and she lived in that camp and grew up in that camp until the early 1960s when Inuit were encouraged to leave their camps and move into the community. So when these drawings started to come in and we had a collection of about 100 or 150 drawings, um, I decided to interview. I wanted to interview Napache and get her to fill in all the details uh, that were not clear in the drawing. So I applied for a Canada Council grant at the time. I had a book in mind. And I thought if I could interview her, I could help her put together a publication of this work. Um, in the end, it worked out even better because um, I showed the drawings to Darlene White of the Winnipeg Art Gallery. She was immediately intrigued, so we got a book and an exhibition. So the collection, I think I'm just going to go through some of the material in the catalog uh, so you can understand a little bit more about what Napache had to say about why she put this collection together. What was immediately uh, intriguing, uh, intriguing isn't even the word, but uh, almost shocking was how intensely personal some of these drawings were. She had exhibited a, an interest in visual autobiography in the past, but she had never taken it as far as she did with this series of drawings. So. One of the first drawings, series of drawings she brought in um, had to do with what might be pleasantly called arranged marriage. But if you look at the drawings, it's clear that it looked more like abduction. 
uh, these were not nicely arranged marriages. These were, it was customary for uh, the camp leaders, the men, to make arrangements for their daughters um, to take up with whoever asked for them. And uh, the women had no say in the relationship. So she brought in drawings of her own arranged marriage to E.G. Vadalu and to others. Um, I guess I'll draw your particular attention to this. This is a drawing of Elisipi, and except where I interviewed her and she made it clear to me that we were talking about folklore or we were talking about mythology, the people that she's representing in, in the drawings are all real people and they're all stories from her own personal history. So in this case, Elisipi uh, is being taken by Mamak Dwak. He's trying to take Elisipi for a wife as usual. Napache had this wonderfully understated kind of dispassionate way of telling the stories. Um, her father is watching. Uh, Mamak Dwak is sneaking up on them when they went to fetch ice. Elisipi's sister is also there and they are all really scared. And you can see by the look on Elisipi's face and the way she has shrouded her little sister that this is a terrifying event for women and uh, a, a social convention over which they had absolutely no control. So when I asked her about it, um, She told me that women never left their abusive partners, even though some had very bad husbands. Abuse was common. It was a shared experience among women. Some had it worse than others. When the women had children, as they usually did, it was hard to leave. I should have left, but I had patience, and sometimes men changed. In the end, it was possible for me to stay. She's also talking about her own circumstances, because in this drawing, this is Napachi, and this is Pitsula, Ashuna, and this is her father, Ashuna, who she adored. But she had a very ambivalent relationship with him because he was a very powerful man, and he was very jealous and possessive of Pitsula, who was a very beautiful woman and very capable, and there was often abuse within the family, and Napachi tried to intervene and stop it. So this is the first time that any Inuit artists, artist has drawn their own personal experience and their own painful personal experience so directly. So she said that after this experience she would never get married herself, but in fact she married E.G. Budlu, and as was the convention of the time, uh, he came and got her and she fought him off. Uh, but in the end, they stayed together and they raised their family. And uh, that was just the way things were until they moved into the community. That was the, uh, Napaches was the last generation to have to succumb to arranged marriages. Some of the other themes she talked about in the drawing, it wasn't all painful. She opened up a whole new window on the lives and livelihood of Inuit women. Uh, she talked about their relationships, but she also did several drawings of women in the camp together, playing, making music together, chewing skins, doing women's work. There's a beautiful example of them making music and playing together when the women were, when the men were out hunting. So it was almost as if the women's, the women existed as a sort of subculture within the culture, supporting each other when the men were away. She would not by any means call herself a feminist, but in some ways <laughs> she was. She was raising the themes that would go on to be raised by her daughter and the next generation of Inuit artists. Uh, for men, the emphasis was on strength and agility and on hunting. 
Uh, she thought of herself as a local historian. There is a drawing at the far end of the wall of a wrestling match, a rather well-known event in local history where people from Dorset on the north side of the Hudson Strait and people from Sugluck or Salowit on the south side of the Hudson Strait got together on Salisbury Island, Salisbury Island and they had a wrestling match. And there has been for generations a traditional rivalry between these two people and local history has it it's because of this wrestling match and because the people from the Dorset side won the wrestling match, there has always been rivalry I got it. I got it. from the people from the other side. Uh, those of you who know a little bit more about Dorset history know about Peter Pitzelak who wrote his autobiography called People from Our Side. That's the side that he's referring to. And interestingly, when I was when I was talking to Napache about a lot of these personal stories, I went through Peter Pitzelak's autobiography, and most of them are corroborated there. So for instance, she talks about Christianity, the early days of Christianity. There is a woman here, Elisipi, who was a preacher. The drawing of Elisipi the preacher. Uh, she thought it was also her intent to show that women occupied unconventional roles. I was very interested to talk to her about shamanism because she did several drawings depicting her grandfather Namanai, who was a shaman, and also um, Alikto, I think her name is, she's the one with the seaweed coming out of her mouth, and she was a female shaman, which was unusual, but not unheard of. And she was very reluctant to talk to me about shamanism, and that is the experience of a lot of ethnographers and anthropologists who want to find out more about shamanism. What I was able to research in order to explain her silence was that they believed, they referred to shamanism as the unspeakable tradition. Because an Anyukak, a shaman, dealt with the most dangerous of powers, his or her own power was by extension dangerous. No one wanted to become the target of his wrath or her wrath, so simply to speak of the spirit world in which the shaman operated was potentially to invite danger. So their reluctance to speak about it actually, it's not so much about sharing it you know, with outsiders, but even among themselves, they did not speak about the shamans. They all knew who they were, but they tended to avoid them, and they certainly didn't speak uh, about what they did. So I was interested that uh, she, um, she was so forthcoming generally about all the rest of the subjects, but when it came to shamans, she, she clamped up. That's the only explanation I could find to back that up. It made perfect sense to me. Some of the other themes that she dealt with had to do with other forms of social deviance and abuse. Um, I asked her whether she was at all concerned about raising these subjects because some of the people that she was talking about were either still living or related to her, and she said no. Uh, she knew that other people had different interpretations of the stories, but these were her interpretations, and she was uh, sticking to her understanding of the way that the stories were told to her. Beyond social documents, though, what is striking about these drawings is that she brought by this time in her career, she had been producing prints for the annual collection since 1960, and she'd done over 5,000 drawings in her career. So by the, late in life, she was a very experienced graphic artist. And she brought all of her artistic talent to the expression, expressiveness in these drawings. Uh, her attention to detail uh, is remarkable and it tells us a lot 
about the social conventions of the time, the way people dressed, the way people interacted, the way people hunted. She also brought all of those details into very sophisticated compositions and decided to use a very restricted palette, mostly only black and white, sometimes flesh tones and pinks, and stuck to that for the entire series. Now, 10 years ago, when these first came to my attention, we could not have known how prescient Napache's example was. Uh, but in fact, well, I'll read you. When, when, we, when we brought this exhibition out, it was uh, reviewed by a uh, Canadian archaeologist and uh, ethnographer Jane Spruill Thompson in Canadian Ethnic Studies. And she said, in part of her review, the curators of a recent exhibition of Napache Boudicca's final, final drawings might have been forgiven if they had second thoughts about publishing this material. We, we didn't have second thoughts. We, we were immediately intrigued and moved towards exhibiting them and publishing them. But the reason she said that is because it appeared that we were no longer unwilling to confront controversial subjects in art exhibitions, particularly when they involve Native people. And uh, after this, uh, shortly after Napache died, her daughter Annie Hudugu and her niece Shubinai and others of the next generation, the, contempor the contemporary artists of today, transformed the face of Inuit graphic art, especially in the medium of drawing. They chose drawing as their preferred medium because it allowed for greater expression, greater nuance. That had never been seen before. And Annie, in particular, decided to tell her own personal stories through her drawings. Uh, I never knew, uh, or I forgot, whether or not this body of work was a direct example to some of the younger artists living in Cape Dorset. But when I reviewed this catalog again, after so many years, I asked her at the time uh, whether or not she had the opportunity to talk to younger people about her work. Um, and she said yes, that her children and grandchildren were amazed by her drawings. They ask questions and I tell them the stories. There is so much that happened to me and to people I have known or heard about, it is almost overwhelming. There is so much that people know. And this for me is the essence of oral history. And she, Napache, added her voice to only a handful of others, Peter Pitsulak, Pitsulak Ashuna, her mother, and Kinoyuak Ashiba. And now we have this body of work, and it carries on the work of Annie and Shubinai. So very interesting to look back at this 10 years later and realize that that whole shift started here. So we can talk about individual drawings, but that's all I'm going to say formally.